So I've just finished a fantastic screenwriting short course at the National Film and Television School uh, in Beaconsfield, just outside London. And in today's show, I'm going to go through a, a few things that I found useful and hope that you can apply them to your writing and creative situation, whether or not you're specifically interested in screenwriting. So um, I'm going to go through why I wanted to do a screenwriting course, some things I found particularly useful and enjoyed and, and noted uh, along the way, um, facing up to the terror of pitching, anxiety and self-doubt, agents and money, and then uh, what are you aiming for and what's next for me? So that's what I'm going to go through in this segment. So First of all, why did I want to do a screenwriting course? So I have been flirting with screenwriting. Those of you who've been listening to the show for years will know that over time uh, I've been to London Screenwriters Fest a number of times. I've interviewed screenwriters on the show and talked about uh, screenwriting. I've read a lot of books on screenwriting. I've done Robert McKee's story, which is basically screenwriting and I have tried to write a script, a number of scripts, I think. I've kind of started them and stopped them and didn't really get to the point of committing. And then in January, I was coming into the new year and I was still pretty tired and I, I was feeling a little jaded with the novel form. And this is what I guess one of my first points. When you're feeling tired and jaded and I'm not a jaded person I may I have a generally a kind of constant up <laughs> well not constant up but I'm very enthusiastic and I I entered January and uh, I mean the weather's been seriously not great for months and but I wanted to feel like writing was fun again and I really I loved Map of Shadows I was very happy with the book um so I decided that I would do a script of Map of Shadows uh in January that was my kind of my January creative stuff and it was fun and it's really amusing because next week I'll be talking about fun and play but the writing the the adaptation of the script was really fun and Dean Wesley Smith always says you know about stop taking yourself so seriously you're being paid to make things up this is a, an awesome job this is the best job in the world <laughs> and of course I was feeling like everything was a bit serious <laughs> and this is my business it is serious in many ways but if it's not fun then you know it's just like an old day job so I wanted to shake things up a bit and because I finished the script and I think this is another key whatever you're doing okay everyone is writing a book in quotation marks or writing a script what you have to do is finish it and as we know once you have a first draft of something then you can start making it better and I finished that script of Map of Shadows it was 105 pages so it wasn't you know it was was actually about the right length <laughs> and so I decided that I would book on this course it came up and I leaned into it. Uh, it. It was a six day course. So it wasn't like, oh, you have to do a master's degree or something. It was, uh, you know, a short course, but still more than just a day. And the National Film and Television School is pretty prestigious. So I thought this would be awesome. So it was the right time for me to do a course. Now, and I say that because, uh, you know, often we can use courses as procrastination. And I probably have done that with London Screenwriters uh, Festival over the years, um, you know, going multiple times and not actually finishing a script. <laughs> but now I have one. So I was really pleased to do that. Um, so it was the right time. Also, my writing style suits screenwriting. And I've been realising this more and more. I write short books, um, my thrillers and my, you know, my dark fantasy are usually you know, 60,000 words. And I am I have an emphasis on visuals. I'm a plot-based writer. Obviously, I have characters, but I, am, I write fast-paced plot. I am commercially minded. And that is a huge part of the screenwriting industry because it has to make money or it won't get made. And when I say it has to make money, I mean, ideally, <laughs> it will do more than break even. But in order to even get funding to make things, you have to have commercial ideas in some form. Obviously, there are auteurs and uh, arty projects, but you still have to get funding from somewhere. So you have to think about the audience a lot more with screenwriting. So I, I feel like it suits me in that way. The other thing that happened, I think, is I realised last year 
in 2017, I had watched a lot of media. I'd watched far more media than I have done in previous years. I still read a lot, um, but it became increasingly clear to me that, uh, especially with the launch of the new Amazon charts, that many best-selling books are bestsellers because they are now a TV show or film, and older books are given a new life. So, Han- *The Handmaid's Tale* re-entering the charts after many years, and um, you know, as I mentioned before, Margaret Atwood didn't make money from that adaptation because she had licensed the rights to it uh, to a company years ago, but she obviously got more money because The Handmaid's Tale, the book, re-entered the charts. Altered Carbon, which was on Netflix, which wasn't a great thing. I mean, I I found it interesting in many ways. that It had a lot of flaws, but interestingly, even in Bath, in the bookstore in Bath, the Altered Carbon books have come back and are now in in the bookstore. So visual media is a great way to sell books. And if you have a foot in both camps, that can be a very good thing. Also, more people watch than read. Sorry, everyone. (laughs) But also increasingly listen. So this is a really important point. And I have learned that writing fiction for audio can be quite different. You can also write audio drama, as I talked to A.K. Benedict about. So considering the other medium that people consume is so important. And it's not just fiction. So on Netflix, we watch a lot of documentary. We watch, um, you know, we, we watch a lot of things for education as well as entertainment. And that's fascinating. Um, we also increasingly watch YouTube for different things for both education and entertainment. And I've been doing a lot more on YouTube myself. So we, I think I, I've come reluctantly to this, but I'm understanding this more and more. I want to reach more people. Uh, you know, I, I want to share my stories and I want to help more people. And I think we need to do that in more than just one format. Uh, one of the industry guest speakers at the course said, we are in the platinum age of TV and visual storytelling, not just the golden age. In terms of the amount of money around, you know, it really is the platinum age. And there's so much more potential to tell our stories in a different way. We have audiobooks, we have more and more channels for visual medium and a new appreciation of the visual medium. So if you have ideas and you can write, there are lots of ways to get your um, ideas in front of other people the book is is one form, the short story, the poem, etc. But there are also these other things too. And I'm I'm kind of putting audiobook in the middle here because more and more people are listening um, and also watching. So I'm I'm pretty excited about where things are going. Um, in terms of the futurist stuff, the um, augmented reality will be adding a layer onto the world. And I think there's so much scope there for, again, education, entertainment, inspiration. There's so much potential and I'm excited to get into this new world. The other thing uh, that was interesting was very much we were talking about the turning point of the second act on the course. But part of the reason I wanted to go is I have been feeling that I am in a turning point of my second act. So I am 43. (laughs) So you could say this is the turning point of my second act. Um, Classically, the midpoint. (laughs) Oh my goodness, I'm (laughs) middle-aged. But I'm also coming up to the 10 years of the creative pen, which feels like a big moment for me. I have a lot of books under my belt and I really am looking for where I want to aim for. I am I am type A. <laughs> My husband reminds me regularly. I'm type A, I'm goal driven and uh, I need a focus. So 10 years ago, I read Jack Canfield, The Success Principles, the tagline of which or the subtitle is how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And the very key sort of chapter one or chapter two, I can't remember what it is, but it's decide where you want to be. And if you haven't decided where you want to be, then how do you get there? So I'm really thinking about that. Like, what is my next 10 year plan? Uh, Don't worry, I'm certainly not stopping the podcast. I'm not stopping writing fiction or nonfiction. I'm still intending to make books um, my 
the basis of what I do, but I certainly want to also write screenplays and start looking at these different mediums. So those are some of the reasons I wanted to go and I absolutely loved the course. It was fantastic. Highly recommend the NFTS um, uh, for anyone. I mean, you can do it. You can come over, come over from wherever you are and, and go do a course there. It's fantastic. So some things I found particularly useful and enjoyed. I mean, I have over 150 pages of notes, so I'm not going to get into too much detail, but just, you know, sort of the overview of what I found useful. First of all, I appreciated the lack of snobbery in the room. I really enjoyed being with a, a group of people. And the what was lovely is like when we were going around the room talking about the different films we liked, uh, there were people in the room who loved, you know, art house movies, non-linear form, uh, different auteur type stuff. And then there are people like me who like James Bond, Lara Croft, Indiana Jones, Con Air, uh, big budget Hollywood explosion movies, which is basically like the fiction I write most of the time. And uh, one of the breakdowns of story we got was a breakdown of Shrek, which I thought was fantastic. Shrek is an awesome story. And there's an appreciation for genre in screenwriting because it's, you know, it's valuable. So when I would say, you know, I'm writing, actually made it a YA, so writing YA fantasy um, feature, big budget feature <laughs> script, basically there was nobody battered an eyelid. Uh, so I love that acceptance of whatever you're writing because I still find that there's just a little bit of snobbery in publishing around genre fiction. So that was great. I really love, love that. Secondly, I really enjoyed the collaboration aspect. I feel like, uh, I mean, I never had a writer's group and I, I'm wary of writer's groups because I think sometimes people in writer's groups are not, you know, they're not necessarily published or producing their own work and I prefer to hire editors. So I've, I've, apart from the co-writing I've been doing, the sense of collaboration was awesome. And I, although I was really nervous at first, I ended up enjoying reading my scenes, talking about story. We had one actor in the group, um, but basically, you know, you don't need an actor to read words on in a script. You could just do it with your, your friends and your family or whatever. And I really enjoyed sharing my work in progress. It's the first time I've really felt that way. And also screenwriting as a, as a, uh, a career, I guess, it's collaboration. It's almost impossible to create without a team. So whereas, uh, you know, as indies, obviously we hire people, we hire editors, we hire cover designers, it is still possible to do everything yourself and many indies do. So, uh, but with looking at screenwriting, unless you are the writer and an actor and producer and director and editor and um, marketer and sales director and everything, it is I would say almost impossible to do something in that world without collaboration and a team. So it feels like the next step. And I almost feel like the co-writing I've been doing over the last few years has been training for this next uh, step. And so that would be another tip. If you feel like you are not doing any collaboration at the moment, then maybe start thinking about that. Because I do feel that having, even if you're, um, you know, just supporting each other with with marketing. It doesn't need to be co-writing, but the working with other people is something that I think writer uh, authors particularly are not so good at. <laughs> so we did obviously we did a lot on story, character, dialogue, action beats, and we read a lot of script pages. We watched a lot of film clips, and I really enjoyed that. Sometimes I felt guilty for watching film and TV. And which is crazy, I know. And I always feel like, oh, I should be reading. But now it's so funny. I've been reading a lot more scripts and then watching the movies and paying attention to aspects of the script. Um, and you can see how well written things are or using subtext or um, uh, portraying character through dialogue. Uh, so I was reading the script of Get Out yesterday um, and really just appreciating because we talked a lot about diversity. And if you haven't seen Get Out, uh, you don't need to. It is horror movie. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the protagonist uh, is is a black guy, African-American. And 
it's it's and it's written you know with with that in mind and it has um uh racial political uh comments really but when you read the script the dialogue is done very very well and so it's so real and when then you watch the the film you can see how it's done and i i obviously i'm not going to go into loads of detail on this but what i did want to point you to if you're interested in this kind of thing is uh check out lessons from a screenplay on youtube fantastic youtube channel where uh, he breaks down different films and how things were written and story so lessons from a screenplay. And in fact, the reason I was reading Get Out is because he just did. He just covered Get Out and fascinating. So that was very cool. We did talk about adaptation and one of the, because of course I am, I'm technically doing adaptation because my books are available in book form. <laughs> uh, but I was discussing this because I could just say these are original scripts because normally you use the adaptation, you know, you put on the front page adapted from if there is a rights thing to be discussed. So, for example, you're adapting someone else's work or work that has already been uh, owned or is owned by someone else where you have to get the, the intellectual property rights the underlying rights. But I own the underlying rights. And so we were talking about how that might differ when I pitch compared to someone who's adapting someone else's work. Um, so oh, just a couple of things that I learned about my own writing. First of all, you need to choose whose story it is. That's very important because many books have multiple protagonists and go deep into different um, areas. So for example, I'm, I have some scenes written from the perspective of not CN and the main character. And so I will be removing some of those. I'll be making it more streamlined. And certainly with a, a feature, it needs to be quite a clear path. Um, whereas, you know, if you're doing a television series, you have a lot more scope for the different characters. The other issue I had was expository dialogue. <laughs> uh, you know, just using questions from the protagonist and then getting answers instead of... So it's a, a, sh a show-don't-tell issue, really. Um, it's also not an exact representation of the story. So you have to change things to suit the story. So, for example, Map of Shadows is, I've called it a dark fantasy, uh, but, uh, but for the script, I'm changing the ages of the characters and making it YA because it is also a coming-of-age story uh, you know, discovery of magic. It has that the the cast of you know a team of characters going out into the into the magical world, and you know, kind of Harry Potter esque in that way. Um, so yeah, it definitely has elements, more elements of YA. And in fact, much of the feedback on the book has been this could have been YA. <laughs> so be true to the form you're writing, not the original, because it's an adaptation. And this is really important because if you get to the um, you know, maybe someone asks you if they can adapt your work. You can't be precious about the adaptation. The whole word adaptation means it's not your book anymore. It's a completely different product, a completely different story, potentially, you know. So being true to the form is so important. We also did go through the beat sheet or the step outline, which if you want more detail, I did with Ros Morris way back in episode 215, um, uh, which uh, was writing plots with drama, depth and heart, which is also the name of Ros's book. And as another book um, recommendation, one of our teachers, Tony Beecar, spelt B-C-A-T, B-I-C-A-T, has a book, Creative Screenwriting, A Practical Guide. So um, really great to learn from that too. And then also just a reminder, because there were a few people on the course who couldn't really get the words out of their or their idea out of their head and onto the page. And I was having a chat with with one of them and, you know, was reminded of the, the quote, which is attributed to many people. Uh, ideas are nothing. Execution is everything. It really ideas seriously are worth nothing. Yeah, you might have a great idea, but unless there are words on the page, it's nothing. And you can't copyright ideas. <laughs> you can only copyright execution. So get a, get your words on the page. 
Your writing is the thing that counts. The way you turn an idea into words is the point. Um, so, you know, turn your amazing idea into a brilliant book or a screenplay and then go talk about it, not the other way around. Like I heard you know, one, one person said, oh, well, you know, I'm really worried that someone will steal my idea. As we've discussed many times, you know, people, you can't steal an idea, you know, an idea that you, you know, two people have the same idea and then one of them turns it into something that exists and the other one is still talking about the idea. The person who has turned it into something that exists is the one who then owns that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> I, I think it's very important to have original ideas, obviously, but it is how you turn that into writing that is important. So the next thing is facing up to the terror of pitching. So classically, we did have to pitch and on the last day to an experienced industry professional. And so that morning I had, well, I had vivid dreams most of the the time actually. Uh, but that morning I woke up at 4.30am with a sort of, uh, you know, heart hammering. I had a bad tummy, uh, which meant I was on the toilet a lot. I had dry mouth. I had profuse sweating. I mean, seriously, it was ridiculous. And a headache, persistent headache, all classic signs of anxiety and signs I recognise, as I often get these things before speaking as well, as I documented in public speaking for authors, creatives and other introverts. Now with public speaking, with my non-fiction side, I have integrated that anxiety or, you know, into my energy for speaking. I understand it, I know how it works, and I have evidence that I can speak well, hopefully, if you've seen me speak, um, and with energy, and I can use that. But with this pitching, I've really never done this before. So I had, I guess I had no evidence that those feelings were, would work out in the end. <laughs> but when these feelings of anxiety happen, it means you care. It means you want the outcome to go well. You have skin in the game. And so I worked really hard. I prepared. You know, one of the ways of dealing with this type of thing is making sure you're really prepared. So I prepared. I had written the whole thing out because at the end of the day, I can only think by writing. <laughs> Uh, I had, uh, so I had my printout, which even included, I kid you not, it had at the top, hello, and then the name of the person, as in I wrote that down. So if I had that complete moment of, oh my goodness, I don't even know what to say, I had written down, hello, uh, name, I'm Joanna Penn. So I, I actually wrote that at the top of the page because I knew I could start with that, but I couldn't even rem remember it enough. So I wrote it at the top of the page. I also wrote down um, slow on a piece of paper, which I put in front of me because as you probably know, I have a tendency to speak fast. And with certainly with the fantasy book, with, with Map of Shadows, there's a lot of words that... Uh, need to be enunciated well so that it's clearer what's going on so that the person can kind of keep up with the different made up words. <laughs> so anyway, the pitch, I did the pitch and it went well. And, but of course it was just a practice. It, this was not a pitch where they were seriously going to then ask for the script. Um, and I still need to revise the script before I'm ready to pitch it. But the idea was to practice and what was really great though was kind of understanding you have to do the same as you have to do with your books. You have to consider the commercial aspects, you know, the genre, the type of project. Is it a feature film? Is it a short film? Is it a TV series? You know, is it a drama? Is it a thriller? Is it YA? Is it romance? Is it a zombie movie? <laughs> I mean, you have to really articulate these things. And then also because, uh, you know, think about comparative successful titles and the potential audience, as well as the budget. So, you know, amusingly, <laughs> I was told that this was, you know, they applauded my ambition at a script that would be over a hundred million <laughs> to make. Um, I mean, I always knew it was big budget. I write big budget stuff. If you read my fiction, most of my fiction is pretty big budget, multiple locations, blowing up stuff. Um, you know, a whole, with Map of Shadows, it's a whole nother world. 
sounds really massive world building. So, you know, they applauded my ambition and, uh, uh, but I probably do need to write something that is, write a script that's a little lower budget. I think uh, One Day in Budapest, I'll probably do next because that is probably my lowest budget. And maybe Day of the Vikings, you know, the sort of more shorter things. <laughs> but it was it was great. And afterwards, I was so tired. I was exhausted. It was it was uh, one of those moments where afterwards you realise how much, how big a deal it was and how much emotional energy was involved. I think a couple of the other things that were important that I learned um, from uh, our teachers who were amazing, uh, who hopefully one of them I will be having on the show at some point. So that will be awesome. And I'll ask more more then. Um, but basically, there was a consideration of who are you? And it's not just about the project, because often the project, the first thing they'll say is, well, you know, great, but what else have you got? And if they're interested in you and your writing, they will understand that you hopefully have more things. So understanding who you are and what you want. And I was reminded of Dragon's Den, or I think you have Shark Tank in the US. Um, and if you've watched those shows, you'll have heard them say, oh, you're investable, or I'd love to work with you, or I can't work with you. So that your credibility as a writer, but also how easy you are to work with are important. Um, you know, what What are your writing chops as such? And why do you care? Why are you the person for this? Also understanding who the person is that you're pitching. So, and I hope that's obvious. If you've ever pitched an agent, um, you should be very targeted. You should know who they are, what other books they like, what they want, what their angle is, and be able to you know, work with that and craft your pitch. The same as any job interview. You know, if you go for a job interview, you should know about the company and all that type of thing. So that was really fascinating. They also did stress networking um, because if you know someone at a particular production company or a director or an actor or another screenwriter, they might be able to get your script in front of the right person. So yeah, I think that's interesting. And if you can work with a production company or an agent, that's great. But a lot of the time you are pitching your own stuff. So if you are interested in screenwriting, then it feels like a double pronged approach. You have to improve your writing. You also have to improve your pitching and your networking, which is the scary stuff for most of us, <laughs> certainly for me. But I did come away with the understanding that I need to get better at pitching, but that hopefully will improve my ability to write sales descriptions and add copy. So I feel like I'm leaning into that side. Uh, yeah. And also just to be clear, when we talked uh, in the group and in the group, there was some very, uh, you know, people who, some actor, you know, actor, some director people, actor, writer, director people, and everyone had massive self-doubt the successful writers just get on with it anyway. And very importantly, do not start by apologising or saying how nervous you are. Don't explain your story before you get to it. <laughs> just own what you've written. You know, this is a YA fantasy um, film, feature film. Announce it. Be proud of it. Never explain, never apologise. So I really... I really did not enjoy the process, but I am now going to learn from it and enjoy it next time. I think that's going to be the key. It's really reframing the things that we have to do so that we enjoy them and learn from them and make things better. Okay, so agents and money. <laughs> Actually, we, we had some agents come in to talk to us. And I think it's very, very similar to publishing in that, you know, there are a lot, it takes a long time to build a body of work, an audience and a reputation. And if it looks like someone has come out of nowhere, they've probably been working away in the background for years. And it really felt like a talk that I heard from, from you know, from agents in the publishing industry over and over again at various festivals. But I think the difference was that they weren't coddling anyone. Like I've heard publishing, you know, agents in publishing kind of coddling writers, um, patting them on the back, I, I guess. Whereas I felt that these agents were very clear that 
you have to do the work. <laughs> so, so they basically said the best time to get an agent is when they come after you and don't expect an agent to find you work. <laughs> They want self-starters. They said, empower yourself and take control of your own career, which sounds pretty indie to me. And you need to get the work and build relationships. And over time, you will start to be recommended for things. And they kind of said, you can get started by entering competitions, trying to win awards and working with people you meet along the way, getting something made, you know, even if you do it yourself. So very much they were like, yeah, it's not like you get an agent and then you don't have to do anything else in the same way that we talk about if you get a, an agent or a publisher as a as an author, that's not it. That's just the beginning. <laughs> you still have to do your, your marketing. You have to write more books. You know, it's not like, oh, we've got an agent. Everything's done. It's you have done a lot of work, then you might get an agent and then you carry on doing lots of work. <laughs> also, the rates for screenwriting, uh, obviously, it depends on where you work, what kind of project, there's a big range. But certainly, again, it feels a bit like publishing, which is you only hear about the breakout successes. You hear the, oh, XX sold their script for XX million. But that's not the reality of most of it. It is similar to writing to, to being a, an author, whether you write fiction or non-fiction, most people are in that long tail of income. They're not in that top spike. Most screenwriters have a money job. I heard that several times. Um, something that pays the bills and enables them to write in the spaces between the rest of life. And again, that's most common with authors. So the creative industries in general, I guess, you, you need something to put food on the table and pay the mortgage. <laughs> uh, also, you need a body of work, not just one spec script. So it's not like, oh, this is my one script and I will just keep bashing away with this one script until somebody makes it. That's not really the way it works. It's um, if you have a spec script, it shows you can write a script. But if you have a couple in different genres, if you have some examples, if you're trying to submit them, if you're working on other things, if you have some other ideas, these are really important. So what they said was, um, you know, the risks are a lot higher in film and TV. So there's a lot more money involved. You need to build a reputation for someone to make your spec script. <laughs> So you need to not be a one trick pony. You do need writing samples, um, but you also need to have more things so that when agents say, what else do you have? You have more than one thing. And one agent said, we represent people because of a body of work. So I think this is exactly true if you want to make a living with your writing. Different books in different genres will help you make income over time and and that's more fun as well. I mean, I can't, I just can bear the thought of writing the same book over and over again, which is what happens to some writers. Obviously, they end up just writing the same thing over and over again. And uh, yeah, that's not how I want to spend my life. <laughs> but I think having these different ideas is quite cool in, in screenwriting. So uh, yeah, important. Uh, so always be writing. I think that was the thing. Also, one of the working screenwriters who came in said that they are working on the sort of commission pieces or other writing work for hire while they do their original stuff on the side in the in the eventual hope or plan that their spec piece might someday find the right home so always be writing and uh yeah i think we're all doing that anyway so that's pretty cool then what are you aiming for and i talk about definition of success all the time I recently did another YouTube video on it and it's something that is so critical to think about. And as I've said before, my definition of success was firstly to get out of my day job and secondly to make you know enough money to hire my husband out of his day job. And that definition of success you know, gave me a clear goal. Obviously, I wanted to do it by writing the things I wanted to write. <laughs> but um, one of the agents started with this too. He started with, what are you aiming for? Here, that the industry is huge and you can't flounder around not understanding where you want to get to or you won't get anywhere. So um, if you compare writing for a big studio like Marvel or Disney to writing an independent film, 
wins at Sundance to writing for an ongoing, continuing drama um, like EastEnders, to writing an animated short, to writing audio drama, um, you know, to writing a theatre play. Now, you can potentially... I guess, do all of these things, but you can't do all of them at once. (laughs) So, and the path to these careers is different and the type of writer you are will be different. So in the same way as an author, you will have a different career if you write six romance books a year as an indie, or if you spend 10 years writing a literary fiction novel that is published by Faber. Um, These are very, very different careers. So you have to choose what you want to aim for in your writing career. And if it seems daunting, consider that you need to take a long-term view. And this is, again, I've been thinking about this because it's like, really, am I going to start again in another industry (laughs) while still trying to maintain my position in this industry, you know, in the publishing industry? I think, I mean, I'm, as I said, I'm not switching. I'm doing this as an extra thing something that I'm I'm interested in doing as well, but I'm going to keep writing books. Uh, but it's very interesting that all of this takes years to get to. So if you think about the next 10 years, what are the steps that you can take to move into different um, places and what will satisfy you creatively? What makes you um, happy creatively? Because there is an end to our lives as I discussed with Dr. Karen Wyatt last week, and we get to choose what we do in the time that we have. So, and if you go back to the interview I did with David Morrell, who wrote First Blood, which became Rambo, and he and I talked a lot about screenwriting and the film industry uh, and contracts. So definitely check out that interview. Um, But he said, you know, when he chooses a project to work on, he writes a letter to himself explaining why he's going to spend time on this project, um, because it may take years. And you have to decide why you're going to spend your precious time on whatever it is. So why do you want to do it? The why behind everything is super important. Okay, so what's next for me in terms of screenwriting? I guess I've I've, I've mainly talked about that already, but this course has proved to me that I want to continue looking at screenwriting. I had fun. (laughs) I really enjoyed it. Like I was giddy and laughing and had just having fun writing. I was giggling away to myself, you know, when I was doing my script. And and fun is not something that I'm very good at leaning into. I I want to start doing that a lot more. I really enjoy watching movies. I really enjoy watching TV shows. I really enjoy reading books. So I want to create all of those things. So I am going to edit this script. Well, actually, in terms of what I'm actually doing in the next few weeks, (laughs) I'm going to rest that script while I finish the draft of how to write non-fiction. So I'm going to go back to that, which I was interrupted. Then I'm going to finish the script, finish the edits of the script, and then work with a script editor to improve it until I have a finished script. Then I will consider submitting it to some competitions and also pitch it at London Screenwriters Festival in September, which I am going on. I may by then have done... um, one day in Budapest or something that's slightly lower budget. (laughs) But my main, uh, I do need to circle back to finishing How to Write Nonfiction, which will be a book and a course. And I've, and then I need to get to the Arcane book, which I've been talking about for ages, the um, New Orleans and San Francisco book, which I, I do have an outline, of, well, I don't have an outline. I have lots of bullet points of things I want to put in that book, but I haven't really planned it yet. But I think the deconstruction of story structure in this course will really help me to uh, work on that. So I have lots and lots of projects. But the thing is, I'm in no rush. I'm not in a rush with this. I do feel like I want to add a, cr- a string to my creative bow. <laughs> in a, you know, metaphorical sense. So this is not a pivot. This is not a change of direction. This is a adding. I'm ready to add something new. Very interested to see where this goes. But I certainly, if you want to improve your storytelling, I think learning about screenwriting is a very good thing. 
So I highly recommend the NFTS short course on screenwriting uh, with wonderful teachers, uh, Tony Bikar and Selena uh, Okwoma. And of course, check out Tony's book on creative screenwriting that I mentioned. And uh, I hopefully will be coming back to this very soon. So I hope you found that useful.